Hi, welcome to Lost in Composition. Today I'm sitting down with Cuban-born artist Juan Alonso Rodriguez, who was gracious enough to let us use his studio for this interview. Hi, Juan. Hello. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so you were born in Havana, Cuba, mm -hmm. and your father wanted you to have um, more possibilities as you grew up than what Cuba could offer. And he approached you about living in the United States with your aunt and uncle in Miami, mm -hmm. and you agreed to this. And you moved here in 1966, is that, that is correct? correct, yes. And what was the transition for, what was it like for you? Well, uh, it was so mixed because um, I, was, I was extremely sad to leave my family, I left. My mom had passed away already by that time, mm -hmm. but I was very sad to leave my father and my two sisters in particular, uh, because you know we lived in a, this big house with, um, it started out, it was my grandparents, their three sons, their wives, and their kids. So it was a, it was a lot of people living in this house, but I really had a great relationship with my father, I loved my sisters, so leaving them behind was extremely painful. Um, and then, you know, coming to the U.S. was exciting. Um, there was that hope of a better life, but at the same time, everything was so new. Hmm. And I had to learn everything, including the language. So, yeah, that, um, that's a rough one. And, you know, I have to say that it was it was very it was very mixed. It was a very mixed bag of emotions. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's understandable. And how has being an immigrant impacted your artwork? I think being an, an immigrant has impacted my artwork a lot. Um, I think that with most of my artwork, you can trace back to the idea or memories or something that happened in my childhood in Cuba. Uh, whether it's some of the artwork with the horizon lines, which you know, were based on the idea that I, I spent a lot of time, especially with, with my father and my sisters, um, sitting on the beach, just looking at that horizon. And so that image is ingrained in me but then it it also took on a, a slightly darker turn because I knew at the time when I was sitting there looking at this beautiful ocean, there were a lot of people risking their lives to to go across that horizon line to get to Florida to you know and they were making you know makeshift makeshift rafts and yeah. awful little tiny boats and things like that. So a lot of people lost their lives. A lot of people uh, were injured. Um, you know, many didn't make it just to try to get over that. So, um, with with most of my work, there's something that goes back to my childhood and being an immigrant. Also, being um, you know, especially coming to Seattle because I didn't really, I wasn't really making art, visual art until yeah. I did. Um, I think when I first started making art, I wanted to make sure to uh, bring my culture into it and sort of expose what I had to say as an immigrant, as someone from another country, someone from another part of the world. So I think if, if there's anything that has definitely um, altered or, or, or paved my path as an artist has been the fact that I am an immigrant. Okay. And that was a really long way of answering your question. No, that's, <laughs> that's a, very good. It gave me a lot to think about. But I'm going to keep this about you. You and I will chat off record, mm -hmm. <laughs> off the camera, because you brought up a lot of memories and a lot of things for myself as well in that comment. It was great. You're also a gay man. In America, you're an immigrant and a gay man. Mm -hmm. That's a tough road. Yeah. Has being gay impacted your art at all? I, it has definitely impacted my life. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that it has impacted my art. Um, I, I have been, you know, I've been excluded from shows of, you know, gay artists because my art 
does not reflect gay life, yeah. um, which is odd to, you know, but I've also been, you know, excluded from Latinx shows because my art didn't fit a stereotype of what Latinx art should be in the eyes of some folks. Yeah. Um, I, I have done, I used to do some photography, I did some male nude photography, but with a twist yeah. where it wasn't like just pretty bodies or, you know, it was, there was usually some sort of composition and some sort of installation in which the body was in, um, in the photograph. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, you know, I've tried to think if that has affected me at all in the way that I make art or, or what type of art I make. And I, I'm sure it has affected me because I think I'm one of those people that thinks that everything that you go through in life affects what you do yes. in one way or another. Mm. Um, it's just not something that I can easily pull out and say, oh, yep, that's, that's kind of why. Yeah, that makes you know. sense. Yeah. So what about being an immigrant and gay and your displayed commitment to community? Has, have those two things impacted your commitment to community? Absolutely, yeah. Um, when, when you feel like an outsider and you, you realize how many people do not like you for, for just that reason, and if, you, and if you had like, you know, gay, Cuban, immigrant, you know, all this stuff, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of not liking going on. But at the same time, I also had, um, have, have, and I have had many, people that have lifted me up <laughs> in those situations. So I have felt that whoever, whoever needs to be lifted at that particular time, I want to be there to do that uh, because I know how it feels. I know what it feels like to, to, be, to feel helpless. Um, so whatever, you know, w if it's the Women's March, I will I'll be there, you know, you know, whatever um, the group that has been minoritized mm -hmm. feels like, okay, we need, we need to lift this up. Um, I want to be there and I want to be supportive in however way I can be. I can appreciate that and I'm very similar in that matter. Yeah. yeah. So let's step back a little bit to when you moved to America and you lived with your aunt and uncle. Were they supportive in your early endeavors uh, art? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually I was pretty, pretty much dismissed about you know, any kind of artistic um, abilities that I may have had. Um, they, you know, they were very blue collar. I mean, you know, we're, we're going back to even you know, before I was born where my, you know, my grandfather had started a wrought iron shop in Cuba. Mm -hmm. um, when I came to the US, my uncle started a wrought iron shop in Miami. Mm -hmm. And the, their idea was like, I was gonna work at the shop. You know, I was, that was gonna be my future. Yep. Um, and in my head, that was not my future. Um, but even when I was working there, I tried to like do some designs because they used to do uh -huh. a lot of wrought iron gates and you know um, bars for windows and things like that. I've seen a gate of yours. Yeah, it's very good. and I I said like, can I you know do something? And they were like, oh, you, no, we, we we can we can handle this. You know, you just yeah. do your job and. So <clears throat> there was a lot of dismissal of that, and and to be honest, I think this it, they didn't think of it, of art as something that could possibly be a career. It would be like uh, a hobby, something that you do on your spare time. Although they would have preferred that I go out and play baseball. Yeah. Um, so they they were definitely not uh, encouraging at all. Even when I started playing music for a living, mm -hmm. they um, their immediate response was like, "Oh my God, you're going to become a drug addict now," you know? <laughs> <laughs> as if like <laughs> one came hand in hand with the other. And I I was just not interested. Yeah. In, in the drug part, I just wanted to perform. There you go. Oh. Cool. Yeah. Really, you weren't interested in drugs. <laughs> I, wa I I wasn't. I 
gosh, at that time, I had never even smoked pot. Yeah. You know, and yeah. well, all the kids in high school were doing that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I'm just, it just didn't interest me. Well, I did your fair share. Yeah, so. <laughs> well, I've done, I've done my share after that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, when you were a kid, did you do a lot of art? Yeah, I mean, that was, that was my pastime. Like, for <laughs> me, while well, other kids were, you know, out playing ball in the corner or, or you know, doing things outside, I was inside uh, drawing, um, sketching, painting, what, whatever materials I could get my hands on. Mm -hmm. um, I remember making things out of clay, um, all kinds of figures and things like that. There were, I remember I went through this whole phase of doing these trees made out of wire and paper and with flowers and, you know, like I would make these little sculpt sculptural cool. trees. And, um, so it was either that or, or playing music, like playing guitar. Mm -hmm. uh, so or anything that was creative or artistic was my, my, my go-to um, for play. Uh -huh. So when you were younger, what, were there any artists, visual or not, that inspired you? <clears throat> uh, when I was young, I was really not that exposed to art. My, mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, my family, I mean, I, I don't ever remember going to a museum or gallery or anything like that as a kid. Yeah. Uh, it was just not, not, something not part of their vocabulary. Mm -hmm. However, I found out many, many years later, like in 1995, when my oldest sister came to the U.S., that before my parents got married, um, my, my father, who worked at the wrought iron shop, would make these um, stands for my mother's pottery. Like I, oh, and wow. I had no, I, I had no idea until 1995. I did not know this because I remember, I remember the house where we lived in, and there was this big kind of uh, terracotta urn, and it was all painted with flowers. And I always thought that, that was this beautiful piece. I didn't didn't know that my mother had made that. Uh -huh. Um, so here are my, both of my parents were, and, and my father was the one that did a lot of the designs for my uh, grandfather's wrought iron shop. Uh -huh. So he was, he was the designer of things. <laughs> uh, and my mother was a potter and, but you know, nobody talked about that when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. Um, so there was that in the, in the back, but I wasn't aware of it. So I, I there was, I didn't really become aware of my, uh, my liking visual art until much later in life. Okay. I was aware of music. Yeah. You know, and I, you know, I, I really wanted to learn how to play the piano. And the matriarch of our family, my grandmother, mm -hmm. decided that piano was for girls. No. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, just like, okay. Uh, so they offered, like, well, would you like to learn how to play the guitar instead? Okay. So I said, sure. Cool. So, and then in the late mm -hmm. 70s, you were performing in nightclubs, mm -hmm. and I was playing the guitar? Yeah. What was, so could you tell us a little bit about that time in your life? Um, that was great. I, I actually miss that. Uh, I miss performing. Um, so yeah, I, I learned how to play the guitar. Uh, I, could, I could sing, um, and I started, I, I started entering uh, Contests like you know, you know, talent contests and things like that, yeah. uh, or I would go to open mics and you know, and play. And it was kind of nice when I would start like winning, you know, these c contests. And so then I, I met this, I met this guy who played piano and also sang, and we started kind of practicing together. Uh -huh. So you know, I thought, oh, you know, we maybe we could do some some singing together. And it turned out that that, that was how I got my first singing job um, and it was this place in downtown Miami called the 2x2 because it was on 2nd Avenue and 2nd Street mm -hmm. and they opened they were going to and it was it, used, it was a, a nightclub it was kind of like a disco and they decided to open a piano bar upstairs from where the disco was and so I found out that this was happening and then I also found out that the the owner was a big Cat Stevens fan uh -huh. 
So at the time, I had long black hair and, and a beard, and I actually trimmed my beard to... I had this big, you know, it was a vinyl Cat Stevens album with his face on it. Uh -huh. And so I just, like, got in front of the mirror and, like, make sure I trimmed my beard exactly <laughs> the way that it was. And so I, and I went, and I went to, to audition and with all Cat Stevens songs, so I got the job, and then I had to tell my singing partner that we had gotten the job. <laughs> <laughs> so, and but I I loved it. I I, I had that job for a while. I sang in different um, different nightclubs. Different. I sang in this hotel in Fort Lauderdale, um, and then that led to some just being like a strolling guitarist in kind of upscale restaurants. That was a thing at the time. Yeah, I vaguely um, remember this. And so it was, it was great. It was a great time for me. Cool. And then you moved here to Seattle in 1982, is that correct? Yeah. And why such a drastic change from Florida to Seattle? <clears throat> well, um, so there had, there had been a few drastic changes mm -hmm. um, because I had moved from Miami to San Francisco in 79. Okay. Uh, in the 81... I thought I was going on vacation and ended up in Key West and ended up there for nine months. Okay. So it was no longer a vacation. It was oh. I was living there. Yeah. And I, and I had met someone in Key West and it was kind of like wanting to just start fresh. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I wanted to do something on my own. I I've never been really good at working for somebody else. Yeah. So I I thought. I kind of want to, you know, do my own business or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we actually started doing some research. Um, wrote to, uh, way before internet, and we wrote letters to the chambers, of, chamber of commerce of different cities, uh -huh. and you know, on the east coast and on the west coast. And Seattle, remember, this is the, around the time where the Boeing layoffs were happening, and oh, yeah. uh, everybody was leaving. The last Seattle. person out of Seattle turning mm -hmm. out the lights was the billboard. And so Seattle was very responsive. And like, yeah, here's all the information about this beautiful city. And I had never been here. Mm -hmm. But then we uh, subscribed to the Sunday paper mm -hmm. from Seattle. So we had it delivered to Key West and started learning about the city and then packed up a, a U-Haul truck and moved. Very cool. Do you like it here in Seattle still? Uh, you know, I do like Seattle quite a bit. I think Seattle has been amazing for my career. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'd have, I could have gotten as much accomplished in a different city where I felt everything had been done. When I moved to Seattle, I felt like I can do anything because, first of all, I, nobody knows me. Yep. Um, I can make a lot of mistakes and nobody will care. And also, not everything has been done. Mm -hmm. It was still a very small young city. and small city. Yeah. So that I think that that was an advantage for me. Um, I have to say that the weather is not my favorite. And I know that you're not supposed to criticize the weather in Seattle because native Seattleites and Pacific Northwesterners get very upset at that. You know, I'm a native <laughs> here, and I love Seattle. Um, the weather, just don't tell everybody that it's actually the best place during the summer. Yeah. yeah. Our summers are glorious. The summers are great. I wish they lasted longer. Mm. You know. Yeah, I yeah. totally get that. Yeah. So after you moved to Seattle, your career, your interest in the visual arts started to take off. And how, can you tell us how your interest, how it went from an interest to an actual career? Mm -hmm. So the way that I started out, and you know, I, and I had, I remember I sold my very first two paintings, you know, outside of like when I was in high school and I would do sketches and I would, you know, sell them for 20 bucks or something yeah. like that. Um, but I sold my very first two paintings when I was still living in San Francisco and my partner's best friend was running um, a, like a hotel, like a small mm -hmm. hotel, and he wanted some abstract work for one of the hallways. So yeah. I, I did some, a couple of pieces for him and got them framed up. But I never really considered art as a career because it, I, 
didn't think that that was a possibility. Yeah. So when I moved to Seattle, I think something something got triggered, especially after having sold those pieces in in San Francisco. And I thought, you know, I really enjoyed doing that. And I here I am in this great new city. I had this beautiful apartment. And I really wanted to be surrounded by artwork, but mm -hmm. I could I could not afford artwork. Yeah. So I thought, why don't I just buy some materials and do some stuff myself? Mm -hmm. And so I did that uh, with no intent of ever showing it to anybody except for whoever came to my apartment. And I was I started a job at a frame shop in Belltown. Uh, it was called Park Lane Framing, mm -hmm. and the owner Dan Michelson was very kind. Um, probably the best boss I've ever had. Oh. Um, and he started, he started noticing what I was bringing to frame at the shop because, you know, it was great because I would get a discount for yeah, yeah, know, yeah. And so he said, why don't you put some of this stuff on the walls and see what happens? Mm -hmm. And I thought, really? And it's like, okay, you know, we can give that a try. And so I did, and he, people started noticing the work and wanting to buy the work. And I thought, huh, <laughs> you know, you know, maybe maybe this is something I could do on the side, kind of, you know. Mm -hmm. And But the more people started seeing the work, and I even had this one gallery from uh, that was close to the frame shop uh, that's no longer there, but they were bringing in stuff to be framed, and they noticed my work, and they, they asked me if I would, you know, want to have some work at the gallery. Mm -hmm. And... I said, sure, and I, I had no idea what I was doing. Uh -huh. um, and then I thought, okay, well, if I'm going to be showing in a legitimate gallery, I want to I wanna ask some questions. I want to know, like, how, you know, how do I, how do I go about this? Mm -hmm. And so I, I started asking a lot of questions. They were very helpful. Um, I just kind of put myself out there just to see where, where it could go. Mm -hmm. um, I did a couple of, I was told about all these uh, summer art festivals that happen around here. So I started entering, you know, all kinds of shows. And, uh -huh. and, and I, I found out that, oh, that's how you develop a resume. And that's how you, you know, you get people to see your work outside of just one place. So mm. um, it happens kind of by chance and by the kindness of someone who yes. gave me an opportunity to see if I could succeed at something um, that really, you know, I hadn't thought about as, as a career. Yeah, that's really cool. That's really yeah. cool. So what have some of your biggest fumbles as an artist been? Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I tell people I, I fumble all the time. Like, ah. I, to me, when I stop making mistakes, that's probably when I need to quit. Yeah. Um, because I, I feel like if, if, I'm, if I'm not fumbling at something, it's because I'm not trying something new. Um, but as far as, you know, career-wise or anything like that, um, I think, you know, when I was, I think, and I think this happens to pretty much every artist or has happened to every artist that I know, like, when you're younger, and like the younger you are and the less experienced you are, and sometimes they don't have to go hand in hand, um, the more cocky you become about like, you know, oh, this is, I am this, and I, yeah. you know. <laughs> I think that's part of youth in general. Right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, so I, I think I, I, I burned some bridges like way back that mm -hmm. I feel like I, I wish I could go back to that person or that gallery and say, oops, you know, yeah. uh, sorry, I was just, I was way off here. Um, and the times that I've had the opportunity to do that, I have. Mm -hmm. um, but um, so there are some people that I, I just don't even know how to reach or anything like that. So I think, I think um, those fumbles have been out of lack of maturity mm -hmm. um, and hopefully I mean, I, I honestly believe I have learned from them. Um, mm -hmm. But then when it comes to like just making art, I feel I welcome those because I feel like um, being self-taught 
<laughs> you have to kind of teach yourself how to do everything, how to you know work the materials, how to you know get the composition right, and you have you know you don't have any kind of teacher present or past to tell you if you're doing it right or wrong. Yeah. So I I'm good with those. I. <laughs> cool. So. During, we did several email exchanges before mm -hmm. uh, this interview, <coughs> and you had mentioned in there that your lack of formal training, you saw that as something that might have, <coughs> if you had formal training, people might have taken you more seriously. Mm -hmm. And when I saw that, I could not help but internalize that because um, I'm in the tech sector, and where degrees are God. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you think that's cultural because I think time and time again, I see incompetent people who have formal educations rise to the top. Mm -hmm. Whereas those who are very competent and show up for work mm -hmm. and they're very creative and they're a workhorse and they get overlooked all the time. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you think that, this could just be me too, if you think that that might be something that's cultural where people with a lot of formal education look at those who don't have any and think, well, they really don't have anything to offer. So, they, so those people with that mindset miss opportunities. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I completely agree. It, I, I think it is a cultural thing. I, th I also think it's a lazy thing um, <laughs> because, you know, you look at people's resumes and you go, oh, well, oh, yeah, like they went to school here and they have this, you know, all this stuff. So they must be good. So yes. it's like, so I don't even have to work that hard at doing any more interviews here because I, I have this proof. It's kind of like, you know, you have a pedigree. You're, you're a dog with papers. And so I can stop right there. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the interesting thing about it with, with art, um, yeah, and I, look, if I would have had the opportunity to have an education, because I didn't, I mean, I didn't even finish 12th grade mm -hmm. in high school. Mm -hmm. I had to go back to get like the, the diploma at night um, because I ran away from home before mm -hmm. I even got a chance to finish high school. Mm -hmm. So I wanted an education. Mm -hmm. my, my uncle and his wife were my legal guardians. They actually discouraged me having an education. They thought, you don't need it, you can work, just, just work at the shop and yeah. you're fine. So it was always discouraged, but I, always, I was always wanting to have a formal education. I wanted to go to college, I wanted to go to university. Um, but when I didn't have the opportunity to do that, um, I, you know, I was going to do what I was going to do regardless of whether I had an education or not. But I, I have come across this thing of like, oh, you're self-taught. These are the same folks that are, um, they love to talk about these very well-known famous artists from the past that were all self-taught, that, yes. that did not have an education. But um, I'll give you two you know, quick examples. One time, many, many, many years ago, I was approached by a local gallery, and they, could, they, they wanted to show my work. Mm -hmm. And I w went to an interview, and, and the owner said, like, so where did you go to school? I said, I didn't. It's right there on my resume that I'm self-taught. Yeah. And they said, oh. Yeah, I don't think that that's going to work with us, um, you know, because we want to show our we want to show our clients that you know you have an education, and it's like okay, that's fine. Yeah. Um, the other the other thing um, I was I was doing some substitute teaching for um, an art teacher at a Antioch University here. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and she was leaving, and she said, "Do you, do you want to?" do you want to take my, my position because I can recommend you? And I said, sure, because it was, you know, it was a part-time gig and it was, 
it was you know fairly straightforward. Mm -hmm. um, and she put my name for it, and they said, "Oh, you don't have a degree." Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I said, "But look at my resume. <laughs> look yeah, at what I've done. Look at what I've done." And, yeah. and I said, "Sorry, we you know we can't hire you unless you have an MFA." And, yeah. You know, so. Yeah. No, I totally get that. And in the tech industry, I. Without a formal education, I decided I'd go get certifications, yeah. and because they're targeted, and you know what, those certifications, <clears throat> I know more about the business and my role in the business mm -hmm. than these people with some of them with masters, some yeah. of them with PhDs. It is they a prejudice. They just don't get it. Yeah, it is, it is a prejudice, and it's unfounded. Mm -hmm. um, because just because you have an education, that doesn't mean that you're good at what you were taught. Exactly. You know, yeah. Uh, but it yep. is what it is for now. Yep. Uh, and I've managed to move forward without it. So. Yeah, same here. So I noticed on your Instagram account that it states that you're looking for out of state representation and looking for travel, for new travel adventures. Um, what's your take on representation in general? So for, for me, um, you know, I, I was at Francine Setters for many, many years, from like 1989 until she closed in 2013. Uh, so I, <coughs> I was like beautifully represented by her. And then when she closed the gallery, I thought, um, does it make sense for me at this point in my career to have to go to another gallery? Um, because I, I've been so involved with the community, I know so many people, mm. that I thought if anyone really wants my work, they can find me. Yeah. And I, don't, I didn't think that I needed the representation. I think if I, if I were to leave Seattle, I would want to be represented by a gallery uh -huh. here. So f when, I, when I talk about representation, I mean, like, uh, I'm thinking about galleries in other cities mm -hmm. where I don't, know, I don't know the people, I don't know the, that community. So to me, being represented by a gallery in another city seems, it makes sense because they're reaching an audience that I cannot. Uh -huh. That makes um, perfect sense. So that's why, yeah, I, I like having people representing me in other cities and other states. Um, other countries it would be fine but you know yeah. yep. um, so that's kind of the way I look at gotcha. it gotcha so apparently you like to travel I love to travel and do you <laughs> go to new places or do you go to tried and true you know th there there are some places that I go back to a lot um, and those are like you know I, I probably go to Palm Springs more than I go to any other place okay uh, it used to be Miami mm -hmm. um, because well especially when I had more people and family and friends there. Um, I still do, just not as many. Mm. <coughs> um, so I, I felt like I needed a dose of the beach and, uh -huh. and Cuban food and just being in that culture. Because being in Seattle, there's really not a whole lot of Latinx or, and especially there's very little Cuban culture yeah. at all. So I miss that. I, I, I need to get a taste of it every once in a while. Mm -hmm. um, Palm Springs is an easy place because it's so close to here. And yeah. I think it's like a two-hour flight or something like that. Um, and it's, it's a place where I, I feel very much at home. Uh, it's easy. Mm -hmm. It's relaxed. Um, I love mid-century modern anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I like the heat. So, yeah. But I also love discovering new places. So your bucket um, list, a couple of. Uh, you know, there's still. I would. I would like to go back. To, I, I've only been to one place in in Spain. That was Barcelona. Uh -huh. I would like to explore Spain a little bit more. There, were, um, like my grandfather was born in Spain in uh, in Galicia, and I like to explore that area and see like well, what was his childhood like. What was the place where he grew up. Uh -huh. um, so that would be interesting for me to explore around there. Um, I kind of want to go to Prague. I've, I've heard great things about it. I do it, too. And I I've never been. been. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I go back to Cuba. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm hoping to go back this year. I want to go to Cuba uh, so to, bad. I still have family there. So mm -hmm. uh, for me, it's not a vacation. It's kind of like just going to visit family. True. And but while I'm there, I like there's there's some places that I'd like to explore. 
mm. that I have that I have never been to. Yeah. So my uh, parents went to Cuba before the pandemic. Yeah. I was really proud of them. Yeah. Oh. And uh, you know, I like to. Mexico is so beautiful, and there's so many beautiful places to explore. I I, I'm, I haven't even begun. Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So let's bring it back to Seattle. What's yeah. your take on the art scene in Seattle? Ah, the art scene, the very complex art scene in Seattle. Um, I think Seattle has amazing artists. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think Seattle knows what to do with us. I think um, we're in this corner of the U.S. that it's not on the way to anything. I mean, maybe Alaska. Asia. Yeah, but... People don't necessarily... I, I, I read this a long time ago about musicians and why musicians were having a hard time, you know, and this was, you know, bef- before it came, became a lot easier to travel and, and, and mm-hmm. Seattle became kind of, uh, more on the map. Yeah, but, you know, a lot of musicians would tour the U.S., but they would skip Seattle because it was either it was that or it was the beginning of the tour or the end of the tour. Uh, because it wasn't close to anything, and and I think that it could possibly impact visual artists as well, because when people think about, oh, where do we want to go look at art? Seattle hasn't made it to that map yet, even though we have very well-known people like you know Dale Trehuley, who has you know created. I mean, he has opened so many doors for glass artists. Yep. Um, but I think still people think that if they come to Seattle, they're going to come and see glass art. So there, uh, there are a few well-known artists that, that are coming from Seattle, but S- Seattle, it, he, we have this thing that we, w- we don't want to show off, and that affects... That is very true. That affects the people that should be shown off. You know, maybe you don't want to show off, you don't want to dress flashy, or you don't want to have a flashy car, you don't want to say how much money you have, whatever. That's fine. Artists need to be shown off. And so your modesty, (laughs) which is beautiful, it's affecting, you know, the artistic value of your own city. And I, I think that there's this contradiction of like, well, we have, you know, we have the best artists and we have the best musicians and we have the best thing. Well, maybe you do, but maybe you need to start telling people about it. Promoting it, yeah. yeah. Because we do. We have artists unlike I've seen yeah. any place in the world, mm-hmm. some of the best. And but those conversations only happen here. They don't, I don't see people going to other places and say, you have to come to Seattle to look at the art. Mm-hmm. I would also say that the art in Seattle is a little bit more unique, too, mm-hmm. because we have a much more diverse, everything from artists like Karen Hackenberg and Bill Braun, who I've interviewed, um, who paint trash, who do Trump mm-hmm. Loy. It's a little <coughs> bit more diverse than people think it would be. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, again, people have stereotypes ideas of what any place is like. Yeah. Um, and I think that the, the art in Seattle is much more sophisticated than people give it credit. Very true. Very true. Much more sophisticated. I like that word. So one thing I love about you is your commitment to helping other artists with visibility. And you have the Front Room Gallery in your studio. Mm-hmm. And I was wondering if you could I don't know if you know this or not, but I interviewed Jazz Brown, and when I was doing research on him, I found him on your website. That's highly unusual to find another artist on an artist's website for me. It's something that you don't see, and I really admire that about you. Um, Could you tell us about how the Front Room Gallery came about where it's going, if it's going anywhere, and what drives you to help other artists network and gain exposure? Well, I think this kind of ties into the question that you know, we were talking about just before, mm-hmm. that I think that the better off 
all artists are, the better off I'm going to be as well. Yeah. Um, I think uh, I want to lift up other artists. I want, first of all, I, I, I want people to make art, whether they are doing it professionally or not, mm -hmm. because I think it helps you on a, solve problems on a daily basis. Just that using that creative part of your mind, I think, is super important. So I encourage artists, uh, whether they're starting out or they're, you know, towards the end of their career, to just continue making art. Um, I want to be surrounded by art. Like, my home is full of art. None of it is mine. Mm -hmm. I have other people's art on the walls. I love sitting in, in my living room or in my bedroom and just, like, looking at these beautiful creations that other people have made that have inspired me, that have, I think, encouraged me to, to make my own um, because I feel like, oh my God, I, just, I, I get so much out of their work that I want to be able to do that for other people. Like I want other people to get something out of what I've made. Um, I, don't, I don't feel like it's a competitive thing at all. I don't compete with other artists, even though we're constantly competing for grants and opportunities yeah, yeah, yeah. and stuff like that. But I feel like, look, if, if I'm not the right person for this show or this project or whatever it is, I'm not going to, it's not meant for me. Yeah. So uh, I, you know, I have, I have been a finalist for things and I, I remember like, especially one specific time where I said, I think the other person would be better mm -hmm. because I, I want to feel really good about what I do, oh. and I, 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 you know, like my reputation is important. So I want to make sure that if I'm going to do something, is I'm going to be like the best possible choice for it. Mm -hmm. um, I feel that my competition is with myself. How, how can I, how can I top myself? How can I be better? Uh -huh. um, and I think you know, showing somebody else's work or promoting somebody else's work takes zero for me like it, it does not take anything away from me and I, I wish some some people need to understand that um, and I think that also I mean I know what it's like to be an artist I know how difficult it is to be an artist and how much support you're constantly needing for for many reasons I mean sure you need the financial support you need people to purchase your work if you work, if, if you make work that is for sale, but you also need you need to hear from people. Hey, you know what? You're doing a great job. I'm never going to buy your work. I can't afford your work, or it's I don't even like your work, but I respect what you're doing. Yeah. So we we need that, and I want I want to be able to do that for other artists because it's it's just such a beautiful mutual thing that happens. Um, so for me, like showing other people's work, it's like, oh yeah, let's like, I, I wish I could still do the front room gallery. It, that ended when COVID showed up and then I actually had to move my office into the front room. Yeah. Um, but then I, I started doing some, um, kind of mentorship, uh, zoom calls. Uh -huh. Um, so I, I, Every once in a while, I'll you know put it out there on Facebook saying like I'm gonna do these free sessions. Um, Very cool. If anybody's interested, and because sometimes and a lot of times they're just about people wanting some sort of validation. Mm. It's not even like I'm teaching them anything. I'm you know, but they're just getting the validation of like yeah, I am an artist, and I freak out over like whether I'm worth anything or whether like I should continue making art or. Anything like that, mm -hmm. and it's like, yes, everybody does. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes you just need to hear that. It makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. So you do fine art for individual collectors and public art as well. Um, how did you get started with the public art installations? So with the public art, I started out like taking baby steps. The, the first few pieces that I did for with with public money because you know there's mm -hmm. public art that's in a public place and then there's uh, public art which is usually paid with taxpayer dollars yeah. so the first couple of things that i applied for were for indoor spaces mm -hmm. um i you know i did something for um lumen field 
and there are four very large paintings that are in that hallway inside inside the stadium. Mm -hmm. I did a piece for uh, a, a federal building in Portland. Mm -hmm. um, there was again in, indoor, and then I started talking to people about like, okay, well, how do I how do I translate you know my work into something that can be done outdoors? Um, so then I, I remember doing some pieces for the light rail station in, in Columbia City. Mm. And I was basically doing the same forms that I was painting, but it was just more like shapes and they were cut out of stainless steel. Uh -huh. So I realized that, yeah, I can translate what I do into, into a material that, that can be outdoors, that can be long lasting. Um, and then from there, I've just kind of kept, you know, inching forward and trying, you know, trying new things. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's been a process, and I I learn every time I, I do a public project, I learn a little bit something about it, you know, from it, and how how do I, how is it going to be easier for me for the, for the next project? Yeah. So it, it's it's been a kind of slow moving, but. Um, I like the way it's progressed, cause, and I like having the balance of making art for the public and then just making my art here alone yeah. in my studio. Yeah, Nice. So some of those public installations are large. Where do you create those? How, what's the process? <clears throat> so I don't create the work myself. Mm -hmm. I design the work, mm -hmm. and I usually go to a fabricator, mm -hmm. um, there's, you know, I've, I've worked with um, the now defunct uh, fabrication specialties, and I mean that's all they did for a very long time is that they fabricated artwork for artists. Okay. And um, I have worked with um, an artist friend, Micaiah Bienvenu, who has a shop in San Juan Island. Uh, I've, I've done a couple of fairly big projects with him. Um, Recently, I've worked with Rainier Industries, mm -hmm. um, so and I've, you know, I always I always like having resources, and I whenever I have a, a project coming up, or at least I'm approaching somebody for a project, I send that out to like several people, and go like, okay, can you? Or is this something that you're interested in working on? Um, sometimes I hear back, sometimes I don't hear back. So mm -hmm. then it kind of narrows down to whoever I heard back from, <laughs> and whoever is available. Um, but yeah, I don't have I don't have the space, the machinery, or uh, yeah. to to actually physically build some of these projects. So mm. um, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So you've said that creating art is medita is meditative for you. Mm -hmm. Is it the same with the public versus the I'd say private, but they're not. <clears throat> you know, they're not commissions. The the pieces that collectors would buy. Yeah, so I, I I call them studio work. Studio work, okay. I like that <laughs> Because term. it's, um, yeah, when I'm here and I'm making studio work, it's everything kind of, the, the focus goes right into what, whatever it is that I'm making. Mm -hmm. And it's not that it's not stressful, but it's also a, a meditative because it's a problem-solving problem exercise. Okay. And so you start, you, you really have to focus on, on the project at hand. Mm -hmm. and, but also, there is just something beautiful about spreading paint. And there's something very relaxing about spreading paint. Um, so it, it is a very meditative process for me. And it's really the only meditative process. I, I mean, I'm not religious or yeah. I don't even think I'm spiritual. Mm -hmm. To me, making art is like the most spiritual or religious thing I could possibly do. So I find that it centers me. Mm -hmm. um, making public work, um, a lot of times I, it is, there is a, a, a part of it that is studio work because I do all the sketching or sometimes I'll do a painting, you know, full size of what the project is going to be just for, so that I so that I feel what it would feel like once it's done. Um, 
but it's a little different because you have to take a lot of things into consideration um, that sort of they don't they don't really take away from the meditative aspect of it but they just it's kind of like don't forget this you know? okay yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so there, those little things are in the background kind of saying okay remember like the safety or the vandalism or the you know all these things that you have to take into consideration when yeah, you're making yeah, yeah. something that's going to be out in public that makes a lot of sense <clears throat> so what are some of your the public installations that you're most proud of and why um, so I, I think for a lot of artists you know whatever the latest project you've finished that's that's the one that you think of the most that makes <clears> sense <throat> yeah. um, but I think that um, I think projects that are very personal um, I I remember like you know when I did the Sentinels for Chief South High School in mm -hmm. West Seattle um, I really had to dig deep as to what I wanted to do there um, I remember um, going to the, fir the first thing that I did when I got that job was go talk to uh, Cecile Henson, I believe that's, I believe that's her last name. Uh, she's a, ch a chairperson of the Duwamish tribe. Okay. Because this, this place is called Chief South yeah. International High School. Um, one of the, one of the f questions that had been raised was like, why, was not, why wasn't there a native artist selected? And I, I went with that to her. <laughs> I said, I know that a native artist probably should have been selected for that, for this project. Huh. However, one was not. Uh, I had nothing to do with the selection process. So that's a, that's a question that needs to be raised with the folks that made the selection. Yeah. Um, and I said, like, and, and I, I kind of wanted her, her blessing mm -hmm. uh, to move forward. Yeah, no, that's perfect. But science. I think I think that approaching it that way uh, helped me. Um, I don't. I wouldn't. Say, I mean, I'm not going to say win her over, but kind of get that because once I once I talked to her, she gave me. She opened up and gave me all kinds of information <laughs> about the Duwamish tribe and what had upset her about the project and and so by the end of that meeting which took about an hour uh, I came away feeling great about what I was going to do so I was honoring I said like I'm not gonna do anything derivative I'm not gonna take anything away from the tribe mm -hmm. I'm going to honor it and bring my own personal history because um, I, that was the first time that I went back and looked at my father's designs in order to create an artwork of my own. So th that experience of really wanting to honor someone or a group of people or the people that were going to benefit from, create, from my creating this art, that, was, that meant a lot to me. Mm -hmm. And I, I walked away with the work, the project done, feeling, yes, I, not only did I accomplish this artwork, but I accomplished a, a, a community uh, outreach as well. Yes, you did. And as somebody who is a project manager by trade, mm -hmm. that was beautiful mm -hmm. how you handled that and how you did that. Yeah. Just absolutely beautiful. So, um, yeah, I think you answered that question perfectly. So you're involved with Artist Trust, correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. And what is it about the organization that earned your trust and support and attention? Um, first of all, Artist Trust is one of the few, uh, or, or maybe the only, uh, there's probably others. I don't want to get anybody upset. <laughs> somebody's going to be upset. Somebody's going to be upset. It's uh, something yeah. I said at some point. <laughs> yep. But it's 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 a private. It's a it's a nonprofit organization. 
um, that has been around for a long time. I remember going to the very early meetings mm -hmm. when David Mendoza and um, and few and, and folk was uh, we were kind of getting together uh, to create Artist Trust, and you know there was this little tiny office on Third Avenue downtown, and I nobody knew who I was. Yeah. You know, I was starting out. Uh, I was really trying to get involved, and I was invited. I was invited to be part of the conversation. So I feel like from the very very beginning, I've had a seat at the table, mm -hmm. and you know being a self-taught, being an immigrant in Seattle, and especially at that time where like oh, yeah. we did not talk about equity, we did not talk about inclusion, we didn't talk about anything, but I was included. I was welcome, I had a seat at the table. Um, over the years, I, I felt like, well, I, you know, I've, I've been welcome here, I wanna continue to support this organization. Um, when, when things haven't, when, when I felt that they were not doing the right things at the right time, mm -hmm. I felt very comfortable calling them saying like, hey, by the way, this is not that great. And I, I felt that they listened to me. That's huge. Uh, and I feel like they listened to other artists. Um, and that to me is a sign of an organization that wants to grow mm. and that, wa that wants to listen. Because what I tell people that, you know, involved in the arts, like you need to hear from artists because if you're not, if you're not listening to what artists are saying, you're not, you can't possibly know how to serve them. Correct. And that goes for any, any group of people. Like if, you know, um, it's kind of like you know, why do men make decisions on women's issues? You know, like yeah, but no, it, you need to listen to what they have to say. Yeah, but it brings it back to your previous comments about going to the stakeholder and you know saying hey I know I was that a native person should have been selected for this but it wasn't um, no. I'm the one that was selected let's talk yeah. let me tell me what your concerns are let me listen yeah you know and really honestly listening mm -hmm. so um, are there any other institutions you'd like to mention um, yeah, I, you know, and I, I do try to get involved with um, with different arts organizations. I've um, <coughs> I've been involved with Pratt Fine Arts. Uh, it's a great school. I mean, I tell people like, you know, you want to take a class, go to Pratt. You know, there's all kinds of things that you can um, you can learn um, there. Um, I I'm sort of semi engaged with. Um, Gage Academy, also mm -hmm. with Cornish. I've uh, been working with them on some things that are kind of brewing, cool. uh, that are not happening quite yet. Um, I am on the board of a new um, arts organization called Art Noir. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, the, the mission is to uplift black artists in Seattle. Very cool. Especially in the, in the Central District, which is where the space is going to be located. Um, so many people have been displaced, and you know, the, a lot of the black population yep. in that area has been so displaced that um, I'm working with Vivian Phillips. Um, she's the you know <laughs> the mastermind of, of this project, mm -hmm. and so I'm I'm on the board of that organization. I'm really excited. I can't wait to see it come to fruition. Cool. Um, but yeah, I. I I, I have my fingers in several pies and just, I'm just kind of doing a lot of this stuff um, quietly and behind the scenes, hmm. um, trying to not be in, in the public eye as much about it. Very cool, very cool, yeah. So, and I can appreciate that because I don't like being in the spotlight, no. but I kind of like to focus the spotlight on others. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm doing right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, do you have any artists that you'd like to call out? Um, are you talking about like local living artists or local living? Yeah. Uh, I don't care. Any that come yeah. to mind that you'd really like um, to call out? You know, there's there. Are, I'm going to get in trouble for not. For who I mentioned, but for whom I you don't forget, mention. But, yeah, but that's okay. Um, but you know, I 
I think that there are some people that, you know, like Barbara Earl Thomas, mm -hmm. uh, Marita Dingus, um, that are just brilliant. Mm -hmm. They're just brilliant uh, artists. Um, I'm fortunate to have like a neighbor like Joseph Steininger, uh, who's amazing. Yes. Um, let's see, um, uh, Preston Singletary. Mm -hmm. I, I think he's amazing. I just, I was in DC and had to go see his show at the uh, American Indian Museum, I believe it's called. Mm -hmm. um, Paul Rucker. Um, you know, these are, these are people that are, you know, amazing artists, but also great friends. Mm -hmm. uh, Stephanie Hargrave, uh, yep. Ricky Wolf. Um, so, yeah. Um, and, and uh, you know, all the folks that I've had in the front room. Oh, yeah, past, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, because I, I really felt strongly in, uh, enough about them that, you know, I felt like I wanted to give them that small, you know, platform. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, if you go to my website, there is a page that says front room, and mm -hmm. every artist that has shown is listed on there. Yep. I've found it. I've been there. I encourage viewers to go out and take a look. And I'll link to that down below. So, um, do you have any final thoughts for the viewers or your collectors? Um, you know, I think people uh, don't realize how much they are impacted by art on a daily basis. And if you try to, if you know, the, the people that are into the arts know this, but there are a lot of people who think that they're not affected by art. They think that this is a, some peripheral thing, but you know, then they read a book, or they wear an outfit, or they watch a TV show or a movie, or you know, they go out and dancing and get you a know, pair of glasses. All these, yeah, all these yeah. things that have been touched by an artistic hand at some point. Otherwise, they would not exist. Yep. And I, th and there also there are many ways to support artists that don't require money. Yes. Uh, you know, when we open our doors here in, in my building, like on first Thursdays or second Saturday, show up. Show up. Tell somebody about somebody's artwork. Yep. You know, you may not be, you may not even like it. You may not be interested. You may not afford it. Tell somebody else about it. That's huge. Let them know that this is happening and that this artist exists and you feel like maybe, hey, I think you're going to like this artist's work. And maybe they might. And maybe they might buy something or maybe they may not. But somebody already knows about that person. Mm -hmm. And word of mouth is still the best form of advertisement. Yeah. And uh, so th there's, there are many ways that you can be supportive and... Um, and it doesn't cost you anything. Yeah. Go to a gallery, go to, you know, they don't charge. No, they don't, they don't. And, yeah. You know, ask them to see works by people that you know they represent, that they mm -hmm. have in the back. Yeah. There's, they'll do that. You know, go um, offer to be an usher at a, at a performance. Yeah. Yep. yeah, lots of ways that you can support it. And I want to touch base on one thing that you said, and I'd regret it if I didn't call it out, and that's the, during the pandemic, walking, you know, we're all locked in our homes and for the longest time we didn't go anywhere. And being able to walk around and look at the art in my home literally saved my sanity. Mm -hmm. You know, because our home is not big. We live in an urban home, it's mm -hmm. the two of us, it's pretty much an open floor plan on each floor. So there's no escape in each other, which, I mean, we love each other, mm. but the art was just huge. Just being able to drink a cup of coffee in front of it and just stand there and get lost. So. Well, it, so this is, this, is a, this is great because I was having this conversation recently with a group of friends, and we were trying to, we were, we were discussing how, you know, people, a lot of times people prefer, you know, to go into an auction and, and buying an experience as opposed to art. And yeah. one of my friends very clearly and, and beautifully said, I think of the art that I own as an experience. 
because I experience it on a daily basis. I'm here, it makes me happy, I look at it. You know? yeah. and, and so, yes, I understand the difference between you know, a trip to Maui and buying a painting, mm -hmm. um, but I think you, you've stated it very eloquently that you experience this art on a daily basis, especially when you're at home. And, you know, that is part of your world. That is, it's kind of like, you know, for me, like I have a small apartment. One of my favorite things about my apartment, besides the artwork that I look at every day on the wall, is the view. Mm -hmm. Like, if my apartment did not have that view, my experience in that apartment would not be as good. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> we have a view too, and it's yeah. nice. It's a luxury, and, but, you know. Yeah. Uh, and it is a static Thing it's a there's a window and I look can look out of it, but mm -hmm. it is something that I experience every day. Yep, yep, exactly. Well, I'd really like to thank you for this conversation. It's been great, and I'd really like to thank you for your ongoing commitment to the art scene in Seattle. It's huge, and I really do appreciate it. Well, thank you for doing this. I think you know this is very important because as we had talked earlier. Visual artists are known for the work, but a lot of times we don't really know much about the person. And or the so, scene. Yeah, yeah. And that's the whole point of this blog and Lost in Composition, so that viewers and collectors can actually kind of spend some time with artists and get to know them. Yeah. So, well, thank you very yeah. much. Thanks for including me. Uh -huh. And if you like this, please be sure to subscribe on YouTube there's going to be links down below to items that we discussed. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you.